Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Please subscribe and hit the bell icon. The game-changing bold and beautiful scene, the show will asterisk never asterisk air, even as the bold and the beautiful has Shyla gloating to Lee, character, assassinating Finn and infuriating fans, it is all in on the villainous redemption arc. But is it really all it's cracked up to be? If Steffi wanted to stop this hooey in its tracks, all she'd have to do is bring back Mom Taylor, or heck, import Sharon from The Young and The Restless. To play the following scene. Which, obviously, the show isn't going to. But imagine how satisfying it would be if Steffi agreed to embrace her monster-in-law, if only she underwent one session with Sharon, with herself, Finn, Bill, all of Shyla's detractors present. You say that you've changed, Sharon begins. I say that because I have, Shyla replies. She's cool, confident. I've got this, she thinks. At what point did you change? Sharon asks. When I revealed myself to my beautiful baby boy, Shyla says, beaming at Finn. You mean Finn, yes? The beautiful baby boy that you shot and left for dead in an alley. That was an accident, Shyla says. She doesn't like this line of questioning, but she can handle it. She has this answer memorized after all. I'm sorry, you left your son for dead accidentally. Sharon says. I shot him accidentally, Shyla clarifies, thinking that she herself has skillfully dodged a bullet. Deacon offers his fiancé a reassuring smile from the sidelines. Reate, Sharon says, shaking her head as if Shyla's response makes sense. You shot Finn accidentally when you were trying to shoot his wife. Was that also accidental? I, Shyla doesn't know how to wriggle out of this one. Bleep. There were extenuating circumstances. Let's talk about that, Sharon suggests. You're a changed woman. What extenuating circumstances would cause a changed woman to point a gun at her son's wife and pull the trigger? You don't understand, Shyla argues. I didn't have any choice. She wasn't going to let me see Finn, see my grandson. She was going to tell everybody that I scratched Brooke's non-alcoholic champagne for the real champagne. Wait, 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 Sharon says. You tricked a recovering alcoholic into drinking. When you say it like that, Shyla admits, shrinking beneath Brooke's glare, it sounds bad. Yes, Sharon replies. It does. Deacon squirms in his seat. This is taking the turn. Now let me get this straight. The therapist continues. Steffi wasn't going to keep your secret, and she wasn't going to let you see Finn and Hayes because you'd already shot her mother, her stepmother, her grandmother. Yes, but that was before I changed, Shyla interjects. And after you changed, Sharon goes on, you shot her because she wasn't going to let you anywhere near her family. Okay, Shyla says, relieved. I think now you're starting to understand the extenuating circumstances that were at play. She visibly exhales and relaxes in her seat, even flashes a woo, smile at Finn. He isn't smiling back though. Steffi is, more of a smirk, really. I think I get it now. Two, Sharon agrees. Your extenuating circumstances were that you were not going to get your way. And your response to that, as changed as you say you are, was to murder your son's wife in cold blood. Does that about sum it up? Shyla stiffens. Her face contorts in anger. I didn't have a choice. Of course you did, Shyla, Sharon says, rising from her seat as if finished. You could have just accepted that there is a price to pay for your past crimes and moved on. No, Shyla cries, seething. No, who could do that? Who could turn away from their own son? A changed woman, Sharon concludes. That's who. With that, Sh Shyla lunges at Sharon and has to be kept from pummeling her by the Foresters and Logans. Never again would Steffi and Finn have to hear about what a changed woman she is. Better yet, neither would viewers. In the heart of a vibrant city, where neon lights danced with the rhythm of the night, there existed a scene so daring, so captivating, that it remained etched in the imagination, never to be aired on any screen. It was a clandestine affair of audacity and beauty, 
a spectacle born of creativity, passion, and a touch of madness. As the moon cast its silver glow upon the city streets, a group of renegade artists gathered in a forgotten warehouse, a haven for the unconventional and the rebellious. They were poets, painters, dancers, and dreamers, drawn together by a shared desire to challenge the boundaries of convention and redefine the limits of expression. In the center of the warehouse, amidst a labyrinth of graffiti-covered walls and discarded props, stood a makeshift stage bathed in an otherworldly glow. The air was thick with anticipation as the audience, a motley crew of misfits and free spirits, took their places on mismatched chairs and velvet cushions strewn across the floor. Suddenly, the room fell silent as a lone figure emerged from the shadows, a vision of raw power and untamed beauty. She was a dancer, her body a canvas of swirling tattoos and shimmering jewels, her movements a symphony of grace and defiance. With a flick of her wrist, the music began to pulse through the speakers, a hypnotic blend of electronic beats and ancient rhythms. So closed her eyes and surrendered to the music, allowing it to consume her, to guide her every step and gesture. As the first notes echoed through the warehouse, the walls seemed to melt away, revealing a world of limitless possibility and boundless imagination. Colors danced in the air, swirling and shifting with each movement of the dancer's body, creating a kaleidoscope of light and shadow. With each twist and turn, the dancer defied gravity, soaring through the air with a breathtaking elegance that left the audience spellbound. She moved with a fluidity and precision that defied comprehension, her body a vessel for the music, her spirit a force of nature. But it was not just her movements that captivated the audience. It was the raw emotion etched upon her face, the pain and passion that radiated from every pore, with each graceful arc of her arm, each delicate flex of her fingers, she bared her soul to the world, laying bare her deepest fears and desires for all to see. As the music reached its crescendo, the dancer's movements became more frenzied, more desperate, as if she were fighting against some unseen force. Her body contorted and twisted in a frenetic frenzy, her breath coming in ragged gasps as she pushed herself to the brink of exhaustion. And then, in a sudden burst of energy, the dancer leaped into the air, her body soaring higher and higher until she seemed to touch the very heavens themselves. For a brief moment, time stood still as she hung suspended in midair, a goddess in flight before crashing back to earth with a resounding thud. As the final notes of the music faded into silence, the audience erupted into applause, their cheers and whistles filling the warehouse with a deafening roar. The dancer bowed gracefully, her chest heaving with exertion, a triumphant smile playing upon her lips. But as she glanced out at the sea of faces before her, she knew that this moment would never be captured on film, never be broadcast to the masses. For this was not just a performance, it was a revolution, a rallying cry for all those who dared to dream of a world without limits, a world where art knew no bounds. And so, as the last echoes of applause faded into the night, the dancer slipped back into the shadows, disappearing into the darkness from whence she came. But her spirit lingered on, a beacon of hope and inspiration for all those who dared to follow in her footsteps and embrace the bold and beautiful unknown.